Live from the ABM Tower in the heart of Amsterdam, we welcome you to this kickoff event of Civic AI Lab. We are Jacob van Ossenbrugge, Hinda Hanet, and myself, Senai Gebreab, directors of the lab. Amsterdam is home to almost 900,000 citizens. In the last 50 years, the city has seen an influx of people from all around the world, from different countries and different cultures. Some came to work, others for study, love, to seek asylum, and so forth. With 180 different nationalities, Amsterdam is one of the most diverse cities in the world. Amsterdam is also home to a wide range of tech companies and startups in finance, in sustainability, in energy, in health, to name a few examples. In fact, Amsterdam has the highest density of tech startups in, uh, uh, in Europe. The city of Amsterdam recognizes the power, the potential in uh, diversity of people and in technology and provides support through its digital, uh, digital agenda, which carries the name Digital City for and by everyone. It also reflects back in the AI research in Amsterdam. In less than two years, ICAI, the Innovation Center for AI, uh, here at Science Park uh, in, in Amsterdam, has grown to a national ecosystem of public, private and public, public uh, AI labs. And more recently, nine knowledge institutes in the Amsterdam area joined forces in the uh, AI Technology for People program that aims at uh, designing, developing, and deploying AI that is fair, responsible, and inclusive. It is against this background that today, on International Human Rights Day, we launch Civic AI Lab, the 15th ICAI Lab. We do this together with our partners, the University of Amsterdam, the Free University of Amsterdam, the City of Amsterdam, and the Ministry of Interior and Kingdom Relations. We have an exciting program for you today with a keynote by Ruha Benjamin, with a reflection by Sigrid Johannesen, uh, with an overview of the Civic AI Lab by Hinda and Jacco, and finally, an official launch of the lab by Geerten Dam, Vinod Subramayam, and Turia Meliani. But first, a word of welcome by Professor Peter van Tindere, Dean of the Faculty of Science uh, of the University of Amsterdam, where Civic AI Lab is based. I give you the floor, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Senai, for this nice introduction. Uh, welcome to you all. As you know, uh, we've been working a long time in, uh, in making the plans for artificial intelligence in Amsterdam together with our partners. And I must say we are quite successful and we are very pleased about that. It's also because we think it is a very important development. If you look behind me in this virtual, in this virtual screen, you see uh, the sustainable development goals. I'm not in my room. This is in my room, but I'm not in my room. So this is fake. Nevertheless, uh, it is also to show that these are very important. And in a recent analysis, it was also shown that AI can have an enormous impact in reaching the goals that are present in these SDGs, as they say. So the benefits can be enormous. At the same time, we also realize that we have to do a lot to make it, to make the applications safe. Uh, I come from a background in biology. I am uh, involved in things that have to do with, uh, with uh, the use of genetically modified organisms, for instance. And there is a link between uh, the tendency there in the past and what we see now here. Uh, I think it was a big mistake in the GMO discussion to focus on the technique as a way to look at what can be done and what can be reached instead of looking at applications and look at applications, what they can do, and also look at the implementation of how it is done. And in, I think with AI, it's extremely important that we also follow this approach, look at the applications, look at the implementation, and really try to do the right things to make it work and make it work in a responsible way. So AI is present in many areas, uh, already mentioned by Senai. We have many labs that concentrate on businesses together with, with private companies, AI for business. 
Last year, we also started in the Faculty of Science with AI for Science, which are projects that really want to improve the quality of the research that we are doing within our organizations. Also very exciting and people from physics, from biology, from astronomy, from chemistry, they are all using AI now in their own research, really fundamental things. So what's, what is missing in the landscape so far are applications that, that are, um, that, that have to do with how AI is positioned for people, like Senai is saying. So I'm extremely pleased that we now can start with a civic AI lab as well as a third pillar that is probably equally important, if, if not more important than the other ones. And that means that we have to do a lot of work in the future. And I trust that all the people that are going to work there will do that. I must also say that I must th thank Senai for getting this together. So the, the, the difference with AI for business in the civic AI lab is for instance also that it is more difficult to get money for a project like this, which is a bit worrying because we think it's very important that people also invest in this. Nevertheless, Senai succeeded in that. Senai managed to get people together and, and managed to start a lab, the civic AI lab here now in Amsterdam. And I congr congratulate him with this achievement and also all of you that are present and listening here because you are the people that are willing and seeing the necessity to invest also in this approach and this application of AI. So let's look for a better future and look at all the types of responsible AI that can be implemented in the future, taking care of what really are the big problems in the world and make it a safe place for everyone. So with that, I would like to give the floor back to the organizers, and I hope to learn a lot of things today on the applications of AI, AI in this particular field. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for your kind words and uh, also for making Civic AI Lab uh, possible. I would like now to introduce our keynote speaker, Ruha Benjamin. Welcome, Ruha. Ruha is professor uh, uh, of uh, uh, African American Studies at uh, Princeton University, where she studies the social dimensions of science and technology, uh, of citizenship and race, of knowledge and power. Uh, she is also founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, uh, and author of a number of books, including Race After Technology, which is very popular and very uh, insightful, uh, I can say. Uh, Ruha, I'm very pleased uh, to see you again, to have you here uh, give the keynote. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sinai, and everyone behind the screens, in front of the screen. Uh, congratulations on this uh, wonderful accomplishment of establishing the Civic AI Lab. It's really my honor to be in conversation, to offer some insights, hopefully, and some conceptual tools to, to help this community move forward. Um, right now, I'm going to try to share my screen so I can share some images and with the help of uh, the tech folks behind the scenes that will allow me to share my screen. And so I've titled my remarks uh, today, Beyond Buzzwords reimagining the default settings of technology and society. And in just a moment, I will begin with the help of the tech folks. All right, I still can't, okay, let's see, it's working now. Thank you for your patience. Um, and so I, I can't think of a more important focus for a new lab than civic AI, um, not only because of what's happening globally, but what's happening right in your own backyards in terms of the implementations of AI and machine learning in ways that too often reinforce forms of discrimination, racism, inequality. Whether we're talking about the Siri initiative that's now discontinued, a program intended to predict fraud, which targeted low-income people and ethnic minorities in the Netherlands, the Sensing Project, which uses cameras to capture license plates and the make and model of cars, which targeted Eastern Europeans and Romani, and also even the Smart Cities initiatives in places like Rotterdam that on the surface seem like a good, a benefit, but in the collection of data can too often be used for forms of surveillance behind the veneer 
of um, objectivity. And so it's in this context that I want to offer some perspectives that really illustrate um, the stakes, not just the stakes for the AI community, but for the larger population that too often don't have a say in how these technologies are developed and implemented. So it's that perspective from beneath, from looking up at, at these initiatives that I really would like us to take in, into consideration. In doing so, there are two main stories that we tell and are told about technology. The first on your left is a story of a, a dystopian story that technology is going to harm humanity. It's going to take all the jobs. It's going to create new forms of discrimination. And while that's true, um, this, this story also hides some of the dimensions that we need to talk about. On your right is the techno-utopian version, which uh, is the idea that technology is going to make everything better. It's going to make things more efficient, more fair. On your left, Hollywood loves to sell us the, 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 the harmful story. Silicon Valley loves to sell us the helpful story. And all they, though they seem like opposing narratives, they share an underlying logic, a logic that we call techno-determinism, which is the notion, the false notion, that technology is in the driver's seat. Technology is developed, and it, it shapes human, uh, society but the people behind the screens are missing from the story that are actually making the decisions about what technologies to develop in the first place. And so moving forward, we really need to keep in mind that technology is not neutral. It doesn't get created in a vacuum, that there are powerful people and institutions and resources that are poured into creating the particular technologies before us. And we can make different decisions with more civic engagement, with more public accountability. And so there are three main takeaways I want to offer today. The first idea is that racism and other forms of discrimination, including ethnic discrimination, xenophobia, classism, et cetera, these forms of discrimination are productive. And by that, I don't mean that they are good. I mean in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. Because still today, we're taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident an isolated incident, a bad apple, in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative, systemic, diffuse, and attached incident. The entire orchard, in the ivory tower, in the tech industry, forward-looking, productive. In my field of sociology, we often say race is socially constructed but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. Secondly, I'd like us to really think about the way that race and technology shape one another, because more and more people are accustomed to thinking about the social and ethical impacts of technology, but that's only half of the story, because social norms, values, structures, all exist prior to any given tech development. So it's not simply the impact of technology that we need to be concerned about, but the inputs that make some inventions appear inevitable and desirable, which leads to a third provocation, that imagination is a contested field of action, not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a battleground, a resource, an input and output of technology and social order. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, and social control. So racism, among other axes of domination, helps to produce a fragmented imagination where we have misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one that's grounded in justice and joy, we can't only critique the underside. We also have to wrestle with the deep investments, the desires even that many people have for social domination. 
So those are the main takeaways I'd like to put on the table. Now I'm going to move to some specifics. At the beginning, I showed you in the Dutch context some of those top-down initiatives that tended to reinforce forms of inequality, initiatives and programs at the city or national level. But also, we need to think about how individuals too often use technologies in ways that reinforce racism and discrimination beginning with a relatively new app called Citizen, which will send you real-time crime alerts based on a curated selection of, in the US context, 911 calls, emergency calls. It also offers a way for users to report, live stream, and comment on purported crimes via the app, and it'll show you incidents as red dots on a map so you can avoid particular areas, which is a slightly less racialized version of other apps called Ghetto Tracker and Sketch Factor, which use public data to help people avoid supposedly dangerous neighborhoods. Now, on one level, this might be considered a civic uh, app, right? It's everyday people using it to look for and keep track of crime. But we have to keep in mind the larger context in which who, which groups are criminalized in the first place, how we're trained, each of us, to look for threat and crime. So in the US, we think about incidents like this in which a white woman called the police on a black family cooking out at a lake in the San Francisco Bay Area. It turns out that even a Stanford educated environmental scientist living in the Bay Area can be an ambassador of the carceral state calling the police on this cookout at Lake Merritt. It's worth noting now, referring back to Citizen, the app, that it was originally called the less chill name Vigilante. And in its rebranding, it also moved away from encouraging people to stop crime, but rather now simply to avoid it. Again, this could be considered a civic uh, AI or digital um, program, but without a critical race understanding, it's going to reinforce forms of profiling and discrimination. What's most important to our discussion is that this app and other tech fixes for social problems are not simply about technology's impact, but also about how social norms and values shape what tools are imagined necessary in the first place. So this is the dynamic that I take up in two new books that Sanai mentioned. One, the first examining the interplay between race automation and machine bias more broadly as an extension of older forms of racial domination. The second is an edited volume on the carceral dimensions of technologies across a wide range of social arenas, from the more traditional sites like policing and prisons to the less obvious contexts like financial technologies, healthcare technologies, the digital service economy, and more. In terms of popular discourse, what got me interested in these issues was the proliferation of headlines and hot takes like these about so-called racist and sexist robots. There were a first wave of stories a few years ago that seemed to be shocked at the prospect that technology is not neutral. A second wave seemed less surprised. Well, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And then we've entered a phase now of attempts to override and address the default settings of racist and sexist robots, for better or worse. And one of the challenges we face is how to meaningfully differentiate technologies that are being used to differentiate us. Take, for example, a recent study, racial bias in a medical algorithm favors white patients over sick or black patients, reports a study by Obermeyer and colleagues in which the researchers were actually able to look inside the black box of algorithm design, which is typically not possible with proprietary systems. And in my review of the study by um, these colleagues, I argue that indifference to social reality on the part of tech designers and adopters can be even more harmful than malicious intent. In the case of this widely used healthcare algorithm affecting millions of people, more than double the number of black patients would have been enrolled in programs designed to help them stay out of the hospital had the predictions, were they actually based on need rather than cost? So race neutrality can be a deadly force. So ignoring race is not the solution here. This combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I've termed the new gym code. 
innovation that enables social control and containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of a previous era, which in the United States was called the Jim Crow era. What I'm drawing attention to with this concept is that technology can indeed hide the ongoing nature of social inequality and allow it to penetrate every facet of our lives under the guise of progress. This is why I've titled my remarks Beyond Buzzwords. This formulation, as I highlight, is related to a number of other ideas and concepts. And so there's a growing literature, scholarly literature, that's really thinking rigorously about this. And so um, within this concept of the new Jim Crow uh, Code, there are four different dimensions that I won't break down today, but which I go into in the book. And so for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight the last two. They fall along a kind of spectrum from the most obvious to the most insidious forms. And so let's take just a second and look at coded exposure, which names the tension between the ongoing surveillance of racialized populations and calls for digital recognition and inclusion or the desire to literally be seen by technology. What I'd like to underscore here is that it's not only in the process of being out of sight as this image depicts, which is the case with many facial recognition systems, but also, and this applies very well to the Dutch case, in the process of being too centered that racialized or ethnic groups are made vulnerable so that being included in something is not a straightforward good, but can be a form of unwanted attention and exposure, but not without creative resistance. In the context of COVID, and I'll just spend 30 seconds here, I want to highlight this element of discriminatory design when it comes to the pulse ox device that many people use on their fingers. Now more people are using at home to, dis to figure out their blood uh, oxygen saturation level so they know when to go to the hospital. And even this device that's widely used has a problem with darker skin. And so one of the, my colleagues at MIT, Amy Moran Thomas, has written a wonderful piece when, in which she says that beyond the pulse ox, this also matters for other wearable chromatic devices and the algorithms they feed. Pretending that they're colorblind can further amplify how racism, not genetics, explains in our case why Black Americans are dying of COVID. And so again, the, these issues are coming, becoming more um, pronounced during the pandemic. Finally, some of the most interesting developments, I think, are those we can think of as techno-benevolence that aim to address bias in various ways. So take, for example, new AI techniques for vetting job applicants. A company called HireVue is one of hundreds now that, that try to reduce unconscious bias and promote diversity in the workplace by using an AI-powered program that analyzes recorded interviews of prospective employees. It uses thousands of data points, including verbal and nonverbal cues, like facial expression, posture, vocal tone. And then it, it compares job, uh, people who are applying for jobs, compares their scores to existing top performing employees to decide who to flag as a desirable hire and who to reject. Well, another value added according to companies like HireVue is that there's a lot that a human interviewer misses that AI can keep track of to make quote, data-driven talent decisions. After all, the problem of employment discrimination is widespread and well-documented, not only in the US, but around the world. So the logic goes, wouldn't this be even more reason to outsource decisions to AI? Well, consider that question in light of a recent study by a team of Princeton computer scientists, which examined a popular algorithm trained on human writing online, which exhibited the same racially biased tendencies that psychologists have documented among humans. In particular, they found that the algorithm associated white sounding names with pleasant words and black sounding names with unpleasant ones. So too with gender coded words and names as Amazon learned a few years ago when its own hiring algorithm was found discriminating against women. Nevertheless, it should be clear by now why technical fixes that claim to bypass human biases are, are so desirable. But as this headline puts it, your next interview could be with a racist bot, bringing us back to that problem space we started with. 
though it's worth noting that some job seekers are already developing ways to subvert the system by trading answers to employers' tests and creating fake applications as informal audits of their own. But in terms of a more collective response, a federation of European trade unions called UNI Global has developed a charter of digital rights for workers touching on automated and AI-based decisions to be included in bargaining agreements. And it's these kind of preventative rights-based initiatives that we really need to grow and take seriously. In the U.S., the Algorithmic Accountability Bill is one effort to create some protections around the ubiquity of automated decisions in our everyday lives. It's a start, but in no way sufficient. And so we really need more and more legally enforceable protections in every country around these, these issues. Another development that keeps me somewhat hopeful is that tech workers themselves have increasingly been speaking out against the most egregious forms of corporate collusion with state-sanctioned racism. For example, a group of Microsoft employees said that as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, quote, we refuse to be complicit. And as this article published by Science for the People reminds us, Contrary to popular narratives, organizing among technical workers has a vibrant history, including engineers and technicians in the 60s and 70s who fought professionalism, individualism, and reformism to contribute to radical labor organizing. The current tech workers movement, which includes students across many institutions, can draw from these past organizer strategies and challenges in learning to navigate the contradictions and complexities of organizing in tech today. In terms of education, which I think is the ground zero for planting a more historically and sociologically informed approach to AI, I'll also mention one concrete resource you can download called the Advancing Racial Literacy in Tech Handbook, which was developed by some colleagues at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York. The aim of this intervention is threefold to develop an intellectual understanding of how structural racism operates in algorithms, social media platforms, and technologies not yet developed, and emotional intelligence concerning how to resolve racially stressful situations within organizations, and a commitment to take action to reduce harms to communities of color. In that spirit, initiatives like Data for Black Lives and the Civic AI Lab are two of many different organizations that are growing all over the world. To take, taken together, this is part of a growing movement of tech justice um, communities that are transforming paranoia about surveillance technologies into power, community power, galvanizing people to take a proactive approach to designing the world they want and need. To that end, and here I'll close, with the words of the late legal and critical race scholar, Harvard, <laughs> Harvard professor Derek A. Bell, who encouraged a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals. He insisted that to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be, which is why I'm convinced that the arts and humanities are so vital to any discussion of civic AI. One of my favorite examples of a racial reversal is this parody project that begins by subverting the anti-Black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention, like the ones I mentioned at the very beginning in, in Netherlands. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white-collar early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system not only brings the hidden but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but it includes an app that alerts users when they've entered high-risk areas to encourage, quote, citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design this algorithm includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from LinkedIn. Not surprisingly, the average face of a criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative set exercises like this are only comical 
when we ignore that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality that are usually targeting racialized communities by deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this manner. Analysts can better expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by technologies. So here's the final proposition. If it is the case that um, inequity and injustice is woven into the very fabric of our societies, then each twist, coil, and code is a chance for us to weave new patterns, practices, and politics. Its vastness will be its undoing once we accept that we are pattern makers. What does that look like in the context of civic AI? It looks like genuinely collaborating with community partners, not enrolling them in institutional agendas that they have no real sense in creating. It looks like refuting anti-Blackness and other forms of uh, discrimination whenever and wherever we witness it, including when it comes packaged in the language of paternalism. Uh, it also looks like rigorously taking stock of the many forms of cultural racism that we witness and that are used to explain disparities among groups. It looks like not hiding behind colorblindness as an excuse not to deal with the harsh realities of injustice. It looks like understanding that inclusion is not a straightforward good because we can include people in harmful processes. And finally, it looks like investing in small changes instead of grand gestures. If, as I suggested at the start, an ahistoric and asocial approach to AI captures and contains people, then a historically and socially grounded approach can open up possibilities and pathways. It can create new settings and code new values and build on critical intellectual traditions that have continuously developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. And my hope is that we all find ways to build on this tradition. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for your fantastic, insightful, and inspiring uh, presentation, keynote. I, we do have some minutes left, so I, I guess uh, I have a number of questions, but I will uh, give Hinda and Jaco the opportunity to raise questions. That Go ahead. Do you have? Yeah, sure. Well, hi, Uha. Thank you so much. This was a very nice talk. Hi. <laughs> Um, so actually, there is one thing that's been uh, puzzling me and that I've actually experienced as a practitioner, as a data scientist, but also as a, as a researcher is, you know, when you, when you bring these things that you've been talking about and you try and make people more sensible to them, and by people I mean data, other data scientists, and try to get them to this, uh, to this field of, you know, being interested in responsibility, often I'm faced with the question, uh, well, you know, if the, if the AI is, is giving us this pattern, it must be true. And if it's useful for the business, if it's making money, why should we care about a minority? Like there is a clear tension with business objectives and responsibility or ethics in general. Uh, and I really struggle in answering that because to me it's like it's, it's, you know, it's a no-brainer. Like we should care about people, we should care about minorities. But how would you address those questions? Yeah, I think that that's crucial because it points to the larger ecosystem in which technology is developed. And if the main values that are driving and the incentive structure that's driving the development of technology is about profit maximization, that inevitably leads to the maximization of discrimination because that's not prioritized. And so part of it is a real reckoning with what values are animating this ecosystem. As an educator, for me, it requires seeding the sensibilities and the different mindset in the curriculum, in the pedagogy. And so when we think of civic AI, it's not just dealing with the populations in our neighborhoods, in our cities, but it's also thinking about students and training and how we actually cultivate a much more rigorous approach to the values that animate um, this ecosystem. And so there's no easy answer but to say that if we are serious about developing technology in the public interest, then the kinds of public accountability that even if a developer or a company would want to create something because they can make money off of it that is discriminatory, we have to have legally enforceable protections that would prevent that from happening. 
we cannot, one, we cannot rely on private sector to regulate itself. <clears throat> That's just not uh, realistic. Um, we see a lot of effort by, by, you know, a lot of the big tech companies to have ethics boards and committees, and th those are not effective. We need to have it squarely in, in terms of public accountability. And, you know, the other thing, is when you talk about the first part of your question about these patterns reflecting reality, the fact of the matter is the reality, the training data that's being used to teach algorithms and AI how to make decisions are based on past human behavior. And so the issue is that past human behavior has been rife with discrimination and profiling and targeting and all kinds of things that are then being used to feed the algorithms and train it how to make decisions. And too often the people who are developing these systems have no education in social sociology or history. They have no sense of what the social, how the social world has been designed, and yet they're designing technologies to fit into that. And so in my estimation, no one should be designing technologies for society that doesn't know how society operates and doesn't know how society is patterned. And so that becomes a, a crucial part of training and education. Rua, I would like to thank you again. We would like to thank you again for this very inspiring talk. Um, Stay safe, we will keep in touch. Thanks. Thanks. So, our next speaker is uh, Sigrid Johannesse. Sigrid Johannesse is uh, a counselor uh, for innovation, technology and science, science at the Dutch Embassy in uh, Washington in the US. Uh, before this, Sigrid was uh, co-founder and director of the National Dutch uh, Startup Program, Startup Delta, uh, and she was advi advisor for uh, Vice President Nelly Cruz uh, for the European Commission on Digital um, Agenda. That's right. Uh, I cannot imagine a better person than you, uh, Sigrid, uh, uh, to reflect on AI innovations in the US, in Europe, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanai. And, and first of all, congratulations uh, to you, but I think also to the whole of the Netherlands with the opening of the Civic AI Lab. Um, it's crucial. Um, uh, and thank you for your kind words. I'm heading into my fifth year now here in DC, um, uh, starting under Obama Biden, uh, rapidly fast forwarding uh, under uh, President Trump and now heading towards uh, a new era under uh, President Biden, uh, which will definitely be um, not going back, but building on what has been done, I think, over the last four years here, but in a different way, because I think what has happened over the last four years is extremely important uh, for the globe, and not only for climate change, but also for the topic what we're here for now is AI. Uh, when I started here, there were three issues or themes uh, which were high on the agenda in 2016, but were hardly present in the Netherlands. Uh, first of all, that was AI. Uh, the second one was economic security. Yeah? In other words, uh, the geopolitical uh, emphasis on technology. And the third one was democracy and technology. Um, and uh, I've seen that changing rapidly, uh, but the last topic I mentioned um, is, I, st I think, still underestimated in the Netherlands, the importance of it. So I'm so glad this, this lab is now opened. Um, what we did from, from our side to put it higher on the agenda, um, especially in the context of AI and human rights uh, and the implementation of ethical AI or trustworthy AI, uh, was inviting ministers. Uh, so one of the uh, state secretaries that we invited also was State Secretary Kaiser about nearly a year ago now to LA to organize a round table on how to implement trustworthy AI. Because uh, it's great that the Netherlands develops principles, but in the end, it's all about implementation. Uh, and I think Rua already gave a, a very good introduction on that, uh, so I won't repeat a lot of things that she has said. 
But I think, uh, first of all, we should realize that in the US, where there's more experience with AI, a longer experience, they've also been working for at least 30 years on how to implement a trustworthy AI. There's a lot of expertise here. So we organized this round table uh, for State Secretary Kaiser, and uh, we saw a couple of things that mattered. Uh, the role of venture capital. Uh, I think Ruha already mentioned the speed of innovation, uh, the role of growing fast. Um, if we want to change things, change things in uh, having a hu more human-centered implementation of AI, uh, the role of capital and VCs should be thoroughly scrutinized because it's all about growth, rapid growth, getting as much customers as you like. And in the last, almost the last uh, matter that is of importance, it's uh, security or human rights. I'm, uh, and I'm not exaggerating here. Um, another thing that came out was uh, the Netherlands is always very good on, in the triple helix, uh, working together with government, uh, academia, industry. Uh, but we heard that they put the emphasis also in include in this development, the expert. So the expert, the AI expert, people who know algorithms. Um, but don't do that without putting that in the right context. Yeah? Include the citizen. I think that's also what Ruha uh, aimed to say. Uh, we need to have a different look, a different look from society, from our values, uh, from our democracy. Uh, I think if the last four years have taught us one thing, it's how vulnerable democracy is uh, and how easy easily it can be overruled uh, by its own principles. We, we choose certain people, um, but it can change rapidly. And uh, if technology plays a part in that, uh, it can have enormous consequences. So again, your civic AI lab has an important task uh, to fulfill. Um, so you, let's say where we were talking about the triple helix, we don't only go to the quadruple helix, but also to the quintuple helix. Eh? We need for the proper development of AI, uh, many more involved players and angles. Um, what has being here in the US for nearly five years, what it, has it taught me? Uh, the very strong and positive thing about the US is uh, its energy. Uh, looking at opportunities, uh, giving each other energy, encouraging, uh, always trying to find ways to make things work. Uh, there is a fascination in this country for groundbreaking innovation. It can never be mad enough. Um, and if it's impossible, they, it just fires them up to even make it even more, yeah, make it work, uh, as I said before. Um, another thing is um, the aim to change the world, to show leadership. Leadership is a big thing here. Huh? Even at universities, you're being asked as a student, where are you going to change the world? What will be your role? What will be your kind of leadership? That's a completely different way of, of looking at education, uh, at research as well, and what you want to do. Huh? Um, what I like here as well is the team spirit. Uh, it's it's co-creating, you do it together. Your network is everything. Uh, you help others, you introduce them, you, you build your network. Uh, Silicon Valley is one big network building community. Um, I think if we have a bit more of that in the Netherlands, uh, that would help us a lot. Um, um, and with this team spirit is also something like, um, yeah, in the Netherlands we have the word draagvlak, yeah, the, the support base, uh, the polder model. And here they just say, listen, if you've got a great idea, you'll get followers. You don't need to discuss this with everyone first. Uh, it will happen. Yeah, and these different perspectives uh, also change um, the speed of things. Uh, uh, things like failing is not a problem, uh, risk-taking is not a problem, you fail forward. And if I compare that to my time at the European Commission, um, it was almost the opposite. But Europe has very, very important values and, and ways of thinking um, that are complementary to the US way of thinking. Um, we have a more systemic way of looking at things. Uh, instead of shooting ourselves to the moon, uh, we first want to know what the universe looks like. Yeah, I'm exaggerating here a bit, but uh, we first want to have an overview of all the possible risks, 
how people feel, what we will encounter, and then we start walking. And if we look now at the great challenges that are facing us from, from climate change to, uh, to this topic, uh, the yeah, democrat, uh, democratization of AI, human rights and AI, we need a systemic way of, lo of looking at things, stepping back first before we go forward. Um, that is almost the, the contrast with the US, um, but here they're catching up rapidly because they're seeing what it brings Europe in the field of legislation. Europe is really leading. We're setting the standards. We're doing an excellent job there. And I think I want to conclude with, with that message. Uh, we should be far more aware of our abilities, our capabilities uh, than we are. We're doing a great job, but in a, a completely different way. Thank you, Sigrid. Uh, it's, a, it's a big question to reflect on AI innovation in Europe, the US and, and the Netherlands, but you have pinpointed a number of uh, issues that we re definitely will uh, take on board. Thank you for your contribution. Um, right, so uh, now it's uh, up to you. Uh, Hinda and, and uh, Jaco, co-directors of uh, uh, Civic AI Lab. Hinda is also uh, associate of, uh, sorry, professor of uh, data sciences at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Jaco is professor of uh, AI at the FU University, uh, and they will briefly say something about what we will be doing at the Civic AI Lab. Thank you, Senna. Yeah, we will give you a, a brief overview of the lab, um, and we uh, like to start with the uh, with the mission of the lab. Hinda. Yes, indeed. Okay, so uh, briefly speaking, um, if we would um, summarize the vision that drives the research that we want to build with our lab is uh, that we want to contribute to building an engaging society where all citizens have equal opportunity to participate and engage in a fair and transparent manner. So we are a research lab and we position ourselves as, a, as an AI research lab. And so the way we want to achieve this is by building AI technologies that are inclusive and that are beneficial to everybody in the city of Amsterdam and beyond. And we really want these uh, systems that we'll be developing or co-developing with our partners to help the citizens in the city, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their circumstances. And even uh, we want them to be helpful to those who are at the margins of our society and that have been historically not benefiting or actually been, even been harmed by uh, those uh, types of AI systems. Um, so we will take a little bit uh, more in detail into the research projects that we have and Jaco will start. Thanks. So to achieve these goals, we want to focus on the development of AI technology that promotes economic and social human rights, such as the right to health, education, employment, but also while respecting fundamental human rights, such as non-discrimination and equality. And second, we want to focus on development of AI technology that promotes inclusive social cultural systems in public and private settings, respecting differences between people and factors such as language, customs, lifestyle, and culture. So how will we achieve these goals? We will um, use data that better and deeper represents the diverse citizens and communities in Amsterdam. We will develop fairness measurements that respect differences between um, and build on citizens' communities in, uh, in the city. And we will develop algorithms that place citizens and communities at the center and not technology itself. So, um, Linda, uh, Hinda. Can you introduce yeah. the projects? Absolutely, yes. So basically, we'll be working on uh, five research projects. And we uh, were very lucky to attract very, uh, very uh, bright students that you can see them here. Um, and basically, we'll be working on three mainstreams, uh, research streams, so uh, responsible AI, explainable AI, and socially aware AI. So first, the first project is the healthcare project. Skip it forward. Uh, where Sarah will investigate methods in data-driven and personalized healthcare for the citizens of Amsterdam, aiming at improved fairness and taking a novel approach by explicitly addressing overlapping dimensions such as gender, race, sexual orientation, class, and disability. The second project is about education and will be led by Maesha, and she will look at the use of so-called Saldonian algorithms for the fair distribution of educational funding in the city. Yeah. And next, we have two students, Ilse and Tim, who will be working on uh, a similar topic, explainable AI. 
and particularly on data that is provided by the city of Amsterdam. So Ilse will be working on obesity data and Tim will be working on imagery data. So they will be using different types of algorithms and try to answer different types of questions. But essentially what they will try to do is to build systems that are useful to answer questions that are raised by the city and, and uh, are uh, answering needs in the city. And also with the intent of making these systems explainable and also actionable so that if the individuals that are impacted by the outcomes of the systems uh, are not agreeing with the outcomes and they have some recourse, they have some way of disagreeing with it. The final project uh, is uh, last not but least by Dimitris. Uh, we will focus on, uh, on uh, mobility and inclusive mobility. And he will use um, the city's public transport and other mobility data in combination with a wide range of other social cultural data to measure where citizens of Amsterdam are being excluded due to the lack of mobility. So Senai, Hinda and I, we are really excited to start this lab um, with a dream team of, uh, of young researchers with lots of talent. And we would like to uh, thank all the lab partners for making this possible. Back to you, Senai. Jaco, uh, Hinda, thank you very much for this uh, overview. Uh, and uh, now we will go over to a short video. So, for the last part of our program, uh, the official opening, I would first like to give the floor to uh, Geert and Dam, uh, Professor Geert and Dam, who is chair of the executive board of uh, the University of Amsterdam. Then I would like uh, to give the floor to Vinod uh, Subramaniam, uh, Rector Magnificus uh, at the FU University. And uh, last uh, but not least, uh, to Deputy uh, Mayor uh, Turia Meliani, who will celebrate and close with us the event. But first, Geert. Senai, uh, thanks a lot also for allowing me to say a few words. Well, the University of Amsterdam and the city of Amsterdam belong together. So for us, it goes without saying that with our AI research and, and education, we contribute, we would like to contribute to the great challenges of the city. There are a lot of complex problems, metropolitan problems, that our AI scientists are addressing. Think of mobility, sustainability, healthcare, discrimination, to name one. And they do this along with their colleagues from also from the social sciences, the humanities, um, medicine, and so on. And I'm really convinced that the current societal problems can only be solved together with our colleagues from the FU, the Free University of Amsterdam, the HVA, the University of Applied Sciences, with our academic hospitals, other health centers, um, business, of course, also private partners, civil society organizations, citizens, and of course, with the city of Amsterdam. So that's why it's so fantastic that under the banner of AI technology for people, we have joined forces and secret is involved as well so thank you for that in our amsterdam coalition the very best scientists in amsterdam work together to use ai for improving uh, people's daily life for improving social economic developments in the region in a sustainable and inclusive way and with the Civic AI Lab, you are now tackling the issue of inequality in the city. And I'm extremely proud of that. Equality of opportunity is, well, it's very important to me. And it's no coincidence that it is a spearhead in the research of the university, University of Amsterdam, and at the municipality, of course. So we have to keep our city our society accessible and fair for everyone, for all citizens. And so I wish you, Senai and Hinda and Jaco and everyone else involved in your beautiful AI lab, every success for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Geert. Uh, Vinod, Professor Vinod Subramayan, it's your uh, opportunity Thank to you. say something. I, yeah. Uh, I don't think I can say very much more than Geert. Uh, uh, she's uh, really so very eloquently uh, put forward why this is so important. 
Uh, and I'm delighted that we are participating as a university in this, uh, as, as the few. Uh, you know, uh, I think Ruha uh, Benjamin also spoke about public values and public accountability being sort of being at the heart of this. And, and it is something that, that for both our institutions is extremely important. When you get into, into this sort of uh, activity, uh, you know, you want it based on, on these public values. Uh, and, and that you use the the that philosophy of uh, of you know to to introduce the checks and balances that you want. Yeah, I mean, I I, I spoke yesterday uh, at at the uh, in Den Haag uh, about the monitor of, of, of you know uh, female professors uh, that was uh, uh, launched. And what I find fascinating here and what I'm really proud about is that what you're doing with this lab is actually incorporating diversity and inclusion yeah, into, into this research. It's the right thing to do. Yeah? We've had a lot of resistance about diversity and inclusion uh, in the last few weeks, but also uh, from all kinds of things. But just because it's difficult doesn't mean you don't do it. Yeah, It's the right thing to do, so you should do it. And I'm really proud that this is what the lab is all about. It is about equal opportunities. It is about being truly representative. It's about equity. It's not just equality, it's about justice. Yeah. And I am delighted that Senai, you and Hinda and, and, and Yako are you know, embarking on this adventure and that we as a university, as universities with, with the UVA as the few and everybody else, the city of Amsterdam, everybody else who's in, involved in this, I'm really glad that this is there because, you know, there are so much darkness in uh, around this issue uh, uh, that you need to shed some light on it. And I'm hoping that you, this lab and this effort will help contribute to change. Thank you very much, Vinod. It is the right thing to do. That sticks in my mind. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, and now, Deputy Mayor uh, Turia Meliani, who is responsible for the digital city, is here with us. I'm happy to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. I'm going to have, uh, have a speech, but I would like to thank uh, 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 Vinod because, because of his passionate words. It's very urgent and, and necessary, so thank you for that. So dear all, and in particular the directors and initi initiators of the Civic AI Lab, Senai Gabriel, Hinda Hanet and Jacob van Ossebrugge. I would like to address you in behalf of my colleagues and Deputy Mayor Victor Eberhardt. Thank you for making the Civic AI Lab happen. And in particular, you, uh, Senai, um, so thank you for your persistence. Because I know it took you a while to get this initiative going. And I know you uh, thought about quitting a few times. I'm thankful that you didn't. Um, but you still went on, and um, and with it anyway. It's I think it's impressive, it's necessary, uh, like Vinod said, uh, because we really need the Civic AI Lab. As a city, we give as much attention to digital rights as possible. We think, for example, that it's important to have access to the internet. Very simple. Uh, just as is uh, as important as a. Uh, uh, as basic human rights uh, like privacy, like freedom, like expression of, uh, like expression, uh, freedom of expression and democracy, uh, offline and online. And there is also an important area where our attention to digital, uh, digital, uh, digital rights is crucial, that is AI. Algorithms and AI become an inseparable uh, part of our lives um, and also our government. And they are, for example, useful to prevent traffic jams and f find smarter routes for cleaning services to analyze if people are missing out social benefits. On the other hand, if you use it carefully, algorithms are also helping our city because 
but they, on the, the, also on the other hand, is very hard to understand. I mean, they're dividing the world into two groups, the people who understand it, the very smart people, and the people who don't. And um, as a city government, I think, for me, it's very important um, that we use them uh, useful. Uh, but it's also responsible to make, them, to make sure that people know exactly how they work. And that's a hard thing. Um, so we have to understand AI. So how can we make it understandable for a lot of people? Not only I as a policymaker, but also the scholars, scientists, and most important uh, people, I think the citizens of this city. The Civic AI Lab is going to be key in understanding AI and its growing, inf its growing influence on us and our cities, but also on our country. Uh, I'm very happy that BZK, the Ministry of Home Affairs, is involved in Civic AI Lab because now it's also an international lab. It's not only for Amsterdam, and that's a good thing. Uh, this positive collaboration with the national government is hopefully start to grow kale, I hope I pronounce it well, kale even further uh, to a center of thinking and designing on AI for citizens. Designing is crucial. Uh, to get a better understanding of the role that AI plays in people's lives and to create positive alternatives in the lab. With that in mind, i like to make one personal note. It's very important to include different perspectives on working on AI. We shouldn't see AI only as a technical thing. My heart also lays with culture. So I cannot stress enough that making and thinking it is important to involve among tech, and, uh, tech, uh, tech experts artists, humanities, but also social science. Because AI, without design, like I said before, cannot function. I don't have to tell you, I'm going to, to tell this to the world, sorry, Senai. No I know you, I know you understand it. So we will make, and I'm actively involved in the change Civic AI Lab can make. And I'm looking forward to see the first results of the lab. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Jakko, on behalf of Hinda, we thank the city of Amsterdam, we thank you, we thank a Ava Hart, we thank the, uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, Internal Affairs uh, uh, for making this possible. And of course, uh, also uh, the UFA and the VU, Vinod, Geert, I think you're there. Uh, I, I know that they're waiting for us to cheer on uh, Civic Eye Lab, so uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do it. I uh, will uh, try to open this. In the meantime, while doing this, I would like also to thank all the viewers today for joining us in uh, opening, launching Civic uh, AI Lab. Uh, stay uh, safe and healthy. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> No, no, this is this is not this is no yeah. This is no alcoholic, so we can drink. Oh, dog. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Good to have you here.